least be able to make a living now and in the near future. You're all very interested, as am I, so I'm just going to let Sergi talk. Uh, please welcome Sergi Galionkin. Thank you. Thank you. So. Oh, it works. Hello. So I'm going to be talking about uh, Indie Apocalypse, which is kind of a thing right now, at least on Twitter. And uh, that's the best description I could come up with. It's a valid event, uh, it's going to destroy all the indie developers, and we're going to be all making Clash of Clans clones. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sergi Kalonkin. I worked in the gaming industry for uh, 20 years now. I worked for the retail distribution for Games Magazine. I worked for Wargaming, Naval, 1C, you name it. And uh, I also host a podcast, I uh, wrote a book about games marketing, and I also a photographer. That's just going to come up later. So all this data that I'll be talking is based on Steam Spy, and I'm quite sure you already use it, but in any case, you can access it on a laptop or a tablet right now. Make your own talk about in the apocalypse. It's much better than you know, listening to me blabbering. Uh, people ask a lot about how Steam Spy operates. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about a little bit about it. It's quite easy actually. It works like an exit poll. It queries uh, users user profiles at uh, through Steam Web API, this is open uh, API, but you need a dev key to access it, and uh, it only queries uh, profiles that are actually open to uh, general public, so user can opt out of uh, the system. But as I found, only around 1% of profiles are closed ones, and they don't affect uh, statistically uh, this uh, uh, accuracy much. So then we do the filtering, we remove those uh, empty profiles, uh, because there are many of empty profiles. We remove a uh, few closed profiles, we convert it into something useful. I'm, I'm using, uh, I'm always anonymizing the data because of European uh, privacy laws. And well, you do extrapolating, which is a basic statistics method you learn in your still like at uh, first course. It's not, nothing fancy. And yeah, obviously displaying graphs, which is what people are actually mad about, because uh, Steam Spy wasn't the first uh, system to use uh, this method. It was actually invented by Kai Orland from Ars Technica for his stock, but his uh, weren't, how do you say, he didn't uh, display it in as pretty as I did, so people are talking mostly about Steam Spy, not about Kyle, uh, Kyle Orland's work, which was, you know, ground for all this stuff. Uh, it gathers around uh, 1.5 million profiles per day, and it's uh, based uh, based on it. Yeah, it does all its calculation. So yeah, in the apocalypse, and uh, when people talk about in the apocalypse, and as some, somebody who worked here in the industry for a long time, I, I find it amusing because it happens like every several years. Not just exactly in the apocalypse, but some kind of event that's going to kill the industry. It started like exactly five years after video games started. So the big deal is that uh, people look at this graph. I, I guess you saw it a million times. I'm really sorry for that, but I'm going to explain it for those two persons that haven't seen it. Uh, we see that uh, median sales of games on Steam are going down a little bit uh, since uh, green light games uh, were introduced. And it's not as dramatic as it seems because obviously the games that were longer on Steam had more time to sell, but you see that drop off is a little bit more than you would expect. And that's despite uh, total sales on Steam, total monthly sales on Steam are doing just fine. They're not dropping at all. There's a little bit, a little drop in the end. It's just uh, uh, could be attributed to the fact that games had less time to sell. And as you know, on Steam, game has, uh, games has a lot to make, but again. So we also see that there are simply too many games on Steam right now. To comprehend, we have around 11 games per day released in August. And that's a huge, it's a scary trend line. I, I wasn't the one to make this rough. It actually was made by uh, Anton Savchenko uh, from Germany. Uh, but <laughs> I really like it, it's so scary, so. Did you know that disco record sales were up 400% for the year ending 1976? If these trends continue, hey! Uh, your fish are dead. Yeah, I know. I can't get them out of there. See, this trend obviously is not going to continue, at least not dramatically, but we don't know where it's going to stop. 
And it, it actually doesn't matter, as we've seen with App Store, it doesn't matter when it's going to stop because uh, it's not about this trend itself. So it, if it's uh, the first time, as, it, as I said before, we saw several, well, not several, many events that would destroy gaming industry, and gaming industry was cont continuously destroyed over the last years, destroyed and rebuilt. It's just uh, so funny that nobody else ever noticed it. For everyone who is involved in gaming industry as a, you know, person playing games, not person developing games. Games industry has been growing steadily. It's just people that are inside are always considered to be dead. So the first apocalypse happened uh, five years after video games were introduced to the mass market. So we saw uh, first sales of games start in 1972, and in 1977 there was a huge crash uh, in Pong market where hundreds of companies were basically driven out of business ever selling uh, Pong machines at uh, loss. The thing is that at 1977, many companies were creating basically the same game. They were creating Pawn, selling it to uh, either end customers or to bars. And, uh, well, they were expecting, like, we sold 1,000 Pong machines last year, we sell, sell 2,000 Pong machines this year, we're going to sell 4,000 next year because it's how trend goes, and it didn't go as well as expected. Then we saw an Atari crash, infamous Atari crash. Everybody's heard about it. It's like the crash of video games. But it wasn't actually really bad. All it happened is was one game that doesn't really sell well. And that's it. Nothing bad as that. And this is the big Spectrum crash. It was, uh, I, I mentioned it, uh, mention it because I started developing games for the big Spectrum as a hobbyist. And it's just completely destroyed me. I, I remember people talking at the time like, oh, it was nice, we had video games, now it's dead, so no games for us. It didn't happen this way, then it's a 16-bit crash when people moved to 16-bit machines, and again, a lot of companies are driven out of business, but games was fine. Well, PC games are dead. If you follow gaming press for more than 10 years, you know that PC games are dead already, like for been dead for 13 years now, since retail stopped selling PC games, and that's where all PC games are supposed to be. Then it was casual games crash. I don't know if you heard about it, but again, game's dead. Then it was social games decline. It's going to be crash like in a year or so. So I expect people uh, talking about it in casual connect some conference. And well, we are arrived at indie apocalypse, which is another big game crash. And I, I expect it's going to be continuing. It's uh, not like mm, it's, it's going to stop. We're going to be dying as an industry like years from now. Yeah, just for the future reference. I mean, it happens, you know, I said it first. So, yeah, uh, about a uh, big uh, video game crash on 1983. It wasn't actually a crash. What happened is at ET, uh, like the flagship of video game crash, sold immensely well. It was the best selling game of 1982. It's just the company behind it overestimated uh, the sales that, you know, would go, uh, the, the sales for the game. And uh, they produced uh, much more copies and invested much more money that actually made sense. Uh, they, uh, pub uh, they published uh, 2.5 million cartridges when customers bought only 1.5 million. And 1.5 million, even now, it's, it's huge, right? But in 1983, that was an immense number of video games. And it was, by any definition, it was a successful game, by any standard. But it didn't sell as much as company expected, so they called it a crash, which it obviously was not. And if you would check sales of 1983 and 1984, well, I did check on Billboard, and we have archives for that, there were no decline in sales, not none whatsoever. The market grew by 50% in 1983. It's, it's just, you know, one company almost went bankrupt and called it a crash, and everybody just went with it. Yeah, so the reasons for this are well described, we are not the only industry to experience uh, uh, those kinds of events. And Mirko Enquist, he mm, wrote an article about uh, three key drivers for crashes like that. He called it 3D, which is kind of ridiculous if you work in video games, but I'll go with it. So the main point is low barrier of entry that we have right now. Everybody can make, make a game, everyone. Just everyone is a developer. You download Game Maker, you download Unity, and you can make your game, your first game in half an hour. My son, he's now uh, 14 years old. When he was 12, he downloaded Unity, created a simple platformer. He's really proud of it. He never went back to actually make something out of it. But still, I mean, if you're 12 year old, 
a kid can make a game, everybody can. Then you have, that's, that's disruptive technology that we have right now. We have YouTube, we have Unity, we have Unreal, we have Steam. Uh, it allows everybody access to professional grade tools. So, like a very entry. And there's like a differentiation because uh, people are developing games that are quite similar to each other. So it's hard, it's really hard to stand out. So, low barrier of entry led to a situation where Steam became not a classic game store. You know, classic game store is a store where you enter, you see top 10 uh, games on one shelf, you see best, uh, you see new arrivals on the second shelf, and it's usually 10 and 10, and you can choose one of 20 games. Steam is no longer like that. Steam is like a library. Uh, Steam is like a bookstore. When you go to the bookstore and you try to pick up a really good book, it's quite hard. They you obviously have top 10 books, but it's usually, you know, 50 Shades of Grey in different editions. And they have new rivals, which is clones of 50 Shades of Grey in different editions. And if you want to go buy a really nice sci-fi book, you go in the end of the store and you dig through books. And you probably won't find a good uh, book if you don't know what you're looking for. You, have, you only come to store to buy stuff. You don't come to store to discover stuff. That's a problem with bookstores. That's why they're losing to Amazon. And it's also a problem with Steam. Steam is not a discovery mechanism. Then there is uh, YouTube. YouTube is not uh, a channel like everybody thinks it, it is. YouTube is like a waves that is used to transfer many channels. Like Total Biscuit is a channel. PewDiePie is a channel. You have hundreds of channels right now. And you have to work with every individual one of them. It's like, I mean, if you've been in classic marketing, I, I, I kind of worked there. You had like three national TV channels. You had maybe 10 uh, smaller channels that are regional. You have maybe 15 newspapers to work with, and that was it. Now you have hundreds on only YouTube channels. And I'm not counting classic channels that are still here, like TV, newspapers, magazines, blogs, and so on. Well, and uh, as disruptive technology and as uh, that made uh, the barrier lower, like Unity and Unreal will help you make faster, but they're not going to make a game for you, not at all. Just, uh, I, I told you I'm a photographer, and photography actually experience an event like this. Imagine, like, now we are complaining about uh, having 3,000 new games on Steam released yearly. Imagine 3,000 developers. Imagine, like, if you have ha 6 billion developers, and that's what happened to photography. Uh, there are many photographers right now because everyone is a photographer. Everyone has an iPhone with, or Android or whatever, whatever, and it has a camera, so you can take pretty good pictures now. Uh, more than that, uh, your pictures now will be way better than pictures by, uh, taken by some professional photographer maybe even 40 years ago because you have access not just to only better technology, you have better understanding of aesthetics of taking photography because you are more exposed to good photographs like now, photo photographs right now that you wore 40 years ago. Those people build a foundation for photography that we have right now. The same happened with video games. And this access to amazing technology that we have right now, thanks to Unity, Epic, Valve, it doesn't make everyone who has access to it a professional creator. They are amateurs, and as an amateur photographer, I'm, I'm happy to admit it. And just, I published, my photo, photos was published in Corps, for example, in Wired and Official PlayStation, but I'm not a professional photographer. I'm still an amateur for indie, if, if you like. And cameras in iPhones didn't kill photography. There are now many more photograph professional photographers than were before, because people learn to admire and uh, to understand the quality and the work that goes into creating uh, photography. It's actually a good thing for the photographers. But of course, they didn't know it, and like maybe 10 years ago, people were complaining about that photography is dead photo apocalypse or something. And there is always a uh, lack of uh, differentiation. Well, some genders are too saturated. You can't develop a platformer right now. I, I just don't know if it's even possible to develop a retro style platformer in these days and stand out. And those are the games that are different, games in different genders that, genders that were released during one week in September when I was preparing this presentation. I'm sorry, it looks like it's again 1983, not 2015. I just, for me, they are too similar. So please, if you're a developer, please, please don't do retro graphics. It's really hard to do right, and it's really hard to stand out, out with it. So yes, the point, it, it all goes down to that developing an awesome game is not enough, and frankly, it never was. So uh, about Steam and its position, I'm going to show the graph that everybody hates a little bit again. So yeah, this is it again. 
So you know what we're talking about. Sorry, that's millions once time. And uh, so probably Steam is doomed, like if sales are going down, so probably Steam is going down as well. And of course, it's not true. Uh, it's obvious. So if you took at, uh, look at top selling games, you know, top 10, they actually were at record high when Greenlight's Game Boy introduced. So the big games that are actual business, you know, people not just making games, but also making money and treating as a business are going up. And Steam is going up, actually. You just, you have more games right now, at, uh, and this affects uh, your perception. So, uh, big games are business, and indie games are hobby. As I said, uh, as an amateur photographer, I get published, I get money sometimes from my photographs, but I don't treat it as a business, because it's a hobby for me, and I don't complain about not being able to make money on it, because that never, never was my intention. I just like taking pictures. And a lot of indie developers they say, well, I like make, making indie games, and yes, it's nice. It's nice to, to do, but if you like making indie games, just do to create indie games. But to make money on indie games, you have to treat them not as a hobby. You have to treat them as a business. Sometimes I hear people like, I'm a developer. I don't want to do marketing. It sounds to me like, I'm a Pepsi Cola. I don't want to do marketing. I just want to create the best soft drink ever. It's, it's nice. It's, it's really ambitious, but it's it never enough. So people ask a lot of questions about uh, current state of, state of events for indie games. And as I said, I have little experience as an indie developer. I worked on indie games, and we were successful, somewhat successful, but I want to still work for big games. So take it with a grain of salt, but yeah. So YouTube, uh, people are treating YouTubers as next holy thing that YouTube is uh, selling your games. And uh, I can't self tell for sure because it's always hard to find which was you know, the reason, the cause and which was um, after that. But it does seem to me that YouTube does correlate with uh, sales. So the more YouTube views and YouTube exposure you get, the more copies you're gonna sell. I don't know if you see that a lot of, there's a lot of small dots in the left lower corner, games that didn't get any exposure or didn't get any sales. Now, this doesn't mean that YouTube is selling your games. It might mean that YouTube is more likely to cover uh, good games, and good games are more likely to sell. It might be the reason, but it does correlate. So it would be safe to say if your games is getting picked up by YouTubers and getting a lot of exposure, it will probably sell well. Yeah, yeah, just one thing that both scales here are logarithmic. So the difference is bigger than you think. So you can see the top is 13 million views for one game. There's a little uh, outsider with a lot of views, but not many sales. It's a game uh, that the guy wrote um, an article about why it failed. And uh, it got a lot of exposure. People made videos about the game, but it didn't help sell it much. So probably it might mean that quality of the game is also important to sell, not just exposure. Yeah. Mm. A lot of indie games are not established developers, but we've been seeing talks about uh, triple I, triple indie, the big games that are big, I don't know, big, big indie developers, which kind of sounds weird, but well, big indie developers are gonna, gonna make it, and uh, those are more likely to survive. It is true. So uh, if it's your first game, uh, you are less likely to sell well than if it's your second, third, or and so on game. Those are average and median sales. Uh, actually, there was a period in time where first games didn't have this advantage, but this was only one year. In 2014, a first game released by unknown company would, more li uh, would likely to sell as much as a second or third game. But I would attribute it not to uh, many new developers entering the, mark, entering the market in 2014, but any, many established developers moving their games to Steam. So like well, uh, Valhalla Chronicles. It was ported to Steam, it was the first game on Steam for this particular developer, but it wasn't their first game and it was quite successful. So this affected uh, an, a median and average in 2014. Every other year I've checked up to 2005, it's always the same. First games are more likely to fail. So yeah, this is the most important, uh, this is the most important graph actually of all presentation. So take a look. Uh, this is a share of uh, games 
of first games on the market and the share of sales. As you can see, we have much more, much um, game, first games entering the market, like 60% of games released in 2015 so far are first game to the market, so it's the first game from this particular developer. But the share is falling. So every new game gets a lesser share of total sales. That's because people are tending to trust bigger brands now, established developers now, and brands starting to matter more in Steam, on Steam, and they mattered before. But this is an obvious thing for every established market. If you look on, I don't know, movie industry, games industry, books, anywhere, established brands, established content creators have an advantage. And that's not a problem, that's a reason to become established content creator. So you would make it easier. Yeah, uh, I also got asked about publisher, if it helps. And that's, there is no definite answer to it because it's, it really goes down to it depends. It depends on the publisher. Because on average, uh, games without a publisher sell worse than games without, with publisher. But because publisher takes sometimes half of your revenue, it might not mean much. And publishers are also more likely to discount games. And uh, that means that well, while you might sell more copies with a publisher, you might make less money with a publisher. So, really, it depends. And if it's your first game, it's even worse, because first games with a publisher tend to do worse than first game uh, without a publisher. You can talk why it is so. I'd say that publishers are more likely to drop unsuccessful game if it didn't launch successfully while developers are more invested in their own games as they tend to support and to update it and to eventually even out the odds. We've seen games that managed to stay afloat despite launching poorly. Not many of them, but we've seen that. Well, developer is, well, publisher is more likely to spend resources on his next game. As you can see, we have a subset of, well, junk publishers that published uh, more than 100 games on Steam already. Those are less likely to sell. So if you're choosing a publisher for your game, Check the track record. It's, uh, it's possible to do on Steam Spy. Just go to, the, any, uh, to this publisher page and check how the games are selling. So you don't, you know what you're getting into. Because sometimes they ask for 50%, sometimes they ask for 60% of your revenue. And you might actually not make any money at all if you work with publisher. Okay, so it boils down to the publisher. So yeah, a little bit of summary. Uh, so to summarize what I've talked about. And yeah. Indiepocalypse is not the end of games or Steam at all. It's not even a thing. Actually, uh, uh, people attributing Indiepocalypse to me, it wasn't me who invented this term. I first heard it from uh, developers of NOVA 111. And uh, I actually think of this particular event as a market maturation that we saw many times in games in other markets. And it's usually a good thing for end user, for customer, because customer gets better game for his dollar and uh, he has more competition, he gets better product. We've seen this in smartphones, in photography, in books, in movies, everywhere. And it, often, it helps. Yeah, so the sales decline that we saw on my first graph, it mostly affects developers that are entering the market, not established ones. Established, one, established developers might fail occasionally, like big name developers might release a game that is not as successful as the previous titles, but it happened even before in the apocalypse. It's a usual thing for any uh, market that's based on creative work. But statistical, statistically significant decline is only affecting developers that are only entering the market. So YouTube is important. It's probably important for your sales. It does strongly correlate. I don't know, again, I will look into it a little bit more. I now have data for YouTube for 2013, so I'm gonna look into it a bit more to understand if it's the reason or it goes after uh, the sales of the game, but it does seem to correlate. And yeah, developing an awesome game is not enough, and it never was, never, never since the game started. Uh, like, uh, as I, I mentioned Pong as the first game, people were cloning Pong left and right and making money on it. So, despite not inventing Pong at all, it's what happens in any dynamic uh, market. So you have to do all the business stuff. If you want to stay in business of making games, you have to treat it as a business. You have to do marketing, you have to do finance, you have to uh, do return on investment calculations, you, you have to do market research, which is my area of expertise. It's, it's really important to, you want, you want to stay in business, treat it as a business. And uh, it boils down to surviving your first game release. 
if you survive your first game, you are more likely to survive your second release and so on. And it doesn't mean that you have to develop a successful game. It doesn't make, it mean that you have to develop a first game that's going to shake the market and make millions of money. Many established developers that I know of, and I'm working for one of them, had the first game fail, fail drastically. But they had real, they had experience, and they had enough resources, which is really important here, to survive and create second, third, and so on, and suddenly, eventually become successful developers. So this is, just don't give up too early. Rami Ismail is going to be talking more about surviving uh, your first game to continue working on indie games. He's going to be talking at 3.20 p.m. in this hall, so I suggest you come and listen, because it's going to be like a continuation of what I'm talking about. And I'm ready to answer any question, and you can follow me on Twitter or drop me an email on Skype if you want. So I'm Thank you.